Greetings students and welcome back to my series on quantum mechanics. In the last few videos we introduced Schrodinger's equation and talked about basic wave function concepts like position, momentum, and then the uncertainty principle. In this video we're going to start solving Schrodinger's equation in one dimension and obtain the time-independent Schrodinger equation. I'll start by writing Schrodinger's equation, which relates the time derivative of the wave function psi to the kinetic energy term of the wave function given by this Laplacian term, which is really just the second derivative in x if we're doing a one-dimensional problem, plus the potential energy term given by the potential operator v operating on psi. We'll start the solution by assuming that v is only a function of x and that it doesn't depend on time. This is an assumption that we'll carry forward for most of the series. When we make this assumption, our Schrodinger equation will get reduced to the following, which I'll call equation 1. Now our goal here is to solve this partial differential equation, but how do we do that? Well, we use something called separation of variables, which you're probably familiar with if you've seen my videos on partial differential equations, links in the description. In separation of variables, the idea is to write the solution psi as a product of two functions, one of which depends on only one of the independent variables x, while the other only depends on t. But if you were paying attention in my PDE series, you'll know that certain conditions have to be met before we can use separation of variables. One of those conditions is that the PDE we're solving must be linear and homogeneous. If you look at the Schrodinger equation we're solving, this is true. The PDE is linear in the wave function we're solving for. It's linear in psi. There is no psi squared or derivative of psi whole squared term. It's all linear in psi. The PDE is also homogeneous. There's no constant or function being added that doesn't include psi. The other condition of separation of variables is that the boundary conditions on this PDE are also linear and homogeneous. But we don't really have boundary conditions, not yet at least. So how can we use separation of variables? Are we just guessing that our boundary conditions will be linear and homogeneous a priori? Well, kind of. This is where the normalization condition comes in. Wave functions must be normalizable. The integral of their magnitude squared over all space must be 1. This is because wave functions are related to the probability distribution of the space our particle or wave occupies. Now, if a wave function is square integrable, if the integral of its square, as shown by the normalization condition, if this integral is finite, it must follow that the wave function approaches zero as x approaches negative and positive infinity. If it didn't approach zero, then its integral would not be finite. We discussed this already in my very first video in this series when I introduced the Schrodinger equation. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule right here, but those exceptions are exotic mathematical functions that hardly ever come up in physics. Anyway, if this rule must be true, then at some point, at the very boundary of our domain, psi must be zero. So eventually our boundary conditions will be homogeneous because psi must become homogeneous at the very ends of the domain by virtue of the normalization condition. This may not be the most rigorous justification for why the boundary conditions for Schrodinger are homogeneous, but it's the best I could come up with and I think it's a better alternative than just hand-waving or ignoring the reasons we can use separation of variables, which a lot of books do ignore. If you have a better justification, do let me know in the comments. Now we've established that separation of variables is valid and applicable in the context of Schrodinger's equation. Let's use it and solve our PDE. We'll start by finding the time derivative of our separable solution. The time derivative of psi is the time derivative of small psi times tau. But since small psi is a constant in time, we can take it out and obtain small psi times the ordinary derivative of tau with respect to t. Next we'll find the second derivative in x of our psi. The idea here is similar. The second derivative of psi is the second derivative of small psi times tau, but in this case, since tau is a constant with respect to x, we can take out the tau from the derivative expression and we'll be left with tau times the second ordinary derivative of small psi with respect to x. Let's now take our second derivative in x, our first derivative in time, and our solution psi and substitute them all in terms of these separated functions tau and small psi. When we perform the substitution, here's what we'll end up with. Let's now divide both sides by small psi times tau to end up with the following. The reason we do this is to officially separate the variables x and t into different sides of the equation. 
This is where we have to be a bit clever. The left side is only a function of the time t, while the right side is only a function of the position x. Now if I change time, then my tau, which is a function of time, could change, and the derivative of tau, which is also a function of time, could change. However, changing time doesn't change anything on the right-hand side, because there's nothing in the right-hand side which is time-dependent. So even though the individual terms on the left might change, their combination doesn't change, because the combination has to equal the right-hand side, which is constant with time. Similarly, if I change the position x, then the left-hand side of the equation stays constant, which means that the right-hand side must also remain constant. So changing either x or t doesn't affect either half of the equation, so we say that both halves are constant. You can prove this to yourself by taking the derivatives of both sides with respect to x and t to show that the whole equation actually does equal a constant. And this constant I'm going to call e. I'll now be solving the time part of this separated Schrodinger equation. I'll move all the non-tau terms to the right, and since i squared is negative 1, it means that moving i to the numerator on the right-hand side will create a negative sign out front. So that means 1 over tau times d tau dt is negative i e over h bar. You can quite easily solve this equation by moving dt to the right and integrating both sides. On the left, we'll end up with the natural log of the absolute value of tau, and on the right, we'll end up with negative i e over h bar times t plus an integration constant c. If we take the exponentials of both sides, we'll find that tau equals the exponential of this entire right-hand side. Using the sum rule of exponents, we can split up this exponential of sums into the product of two exponentials. Now the exponential of the constant c is just another constant, which I'll call a. So eventually, we'll find that tau of t is a times the exponential of negative i e over h bar times t. Meanwhile, the differential equation involving position is the following. If I multiply both sides by small psi, here's what I'll get. Now I'm going to box this equation, because it's quite special. It's called a time-independent Schrodinger equation. There is no dependence of this equation on time. We can only solve it, though, if we specify the potential operator v. So we have to stop here. Once we solve this time-independent Schrodinger and obtain a solution for small psi, our overall wave function psi will be small psi of x times the exponential of negative i e over h bar times t. Of course, the constant of integration a that I had earlier with the tau will be absorbed into the small psi, which is why I haven't included it here. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk about the physical significance of the small psi and how it represents the stationary states of the system governed by the Schrodinger equation. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.